You're listening to the Control System Integrators Association's Talking Industrial Automation Podcast, where you get to know the people that make modern manufacturing and processing possible. Now, here is your host, Tony Verovin. Thanks for downloading the Talking Industrial Automation Podcast. This is a show to help you get to know the people that make modern manufacturing and processing possible. I'll be talking industrial automation with CSIA system integrators and industry partners to get a better understanding of how they help their clients solve manufacturing and process challenges and how they became successful in their careers. Along the way, we will touch on system integration best practices, technology, trends, and challenges. Whether you are a manufacturer, end user, supplier, or system integrator, I hope you will enjoy the insights CSIA members will bring to this podcast. In this episode, you get to know Jeff Miller, Director of Project Management at Interstates Control Systems, a system integrator based in Sioux Center, Iowa. Jeff is based out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and is the current chairman of the board of the Control System Integrators Association. You'll learn that Jeff always had a affinity for engineering, why hackers are attacking industrial sites, and what traits successful system integrators always seem to have. Enjoy getting to know Jeff Miller of Interstates Control Systems. Hi, this is Tony Verovin. I am the marketing manager with CSIA. And uh, this episode, we're interviewing Jeff Miller with Interstate, Interstates uh, Control Systems. Did I say your company name right? You did. Thank you. All right. There it is. Oh, and you got it. You got your logo on your uh, shirt there. So great. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thank you. I'm glad to do so. Jeff, uh, I've gotten to know you over the last uh, couple of years here, and I've I've seen you uh, uh, recently take a new position here. You are currently well. You've been on the board, right? And uh, right. and now you've uh, recently taken over as chairman. Correct. Yes, my first uh, year as chairman, and uh, uh, very much enjoying it, and and getting to know a lot more people through, uh, through that role. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, Jeff, you've been a, a member for a, a long time uh, of CSIA and a member, I think of the best practices committee. Correct. I, I actually just looked yesterday. We've been a, a member since 2002. Um, and we've been certified since 2003. So, uh, we got started and then I have been on, Best Practices Committee, I think I started in 2002, um, spent quite a bit of time uh, helping, then I was chair of the Best Practices Committee for quite a few years, um, and I'm still on the Best Practices Committee as, uh, as chairman of the board, but um, probably not going to be as active as I have been in the past. So Right, right. You got, you got the ship to steer, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. So, um, got. I just wanted to have a good conversation with you and and help um, help our viewers get to know you better. You know, people people typically do uh, business with people they they like and know and trust, not with uh, logos. Logos don't do business with one another. So, love to talk to you a little bit about uh, how you got into this business. How how did you become a, a control system engineer? Is that was that you know. You wanted to be that instead of an astronaut, maybe growing up. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, not. Uh, uh, my dad is uh, was a power engineer, um, worked in the transformer business his whole life, um, and he got me interested in engineering. Uh, and I so went to engineering school, and I actually went into power engineering. Uh, moved all the way to Arkansas for uh, for four years and worked for Arkansas Power and Light, and. Uh, kind of got my feet wet as someone as a service engineer, somebody who spends a lot of time with clients. And I really liked that, you know, being able to spend time with clients and, and find out what their problems are and help them solve, uh, you know, not just design something for them, but really solve a problem that they had. And, and so um, I did spend uh, 10 years of my career working in the transformer business, though when I moved back from Arkansas Power & Light, but it was the service part of our business again there. I, I, we, did, we did a lot of service work for uh, large power companies uh, servicing their, their substation transformers. 
And uh, so I got involved in a lot of that. We built a lot of equipment that, that, would, um, that had automation in it. Uh, although back in those days, it wasn't as sophisticated as the automation we have today. Uh, so I always really liked that, just engineering on the fly and trying to find things that would help a customer really solve a problem. And when I came to Interstates, um, I came into the project management world and I had managed a lot of project type teams. But what I, again, really enjoyed there was uh, just getting to know clients finding out how we could really build a solution that, that, uh, that did what they needed, not just what they were asking for, because many times the client didn't know what was even possible. So, so that's what's really cool about this business as a systems integrator. You see other things you can really do to help them get better at what they do, solve their problems, even though they didn't even know they had a problem sometimes. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. so it's a cool business, you know. Yeah, sometimes it seems like the, uh, you know, if there's if there's no smoke, there's there's no fire, right? Right, and, exactly. And so nothing's wrong, right? And right. May, maybe not be, might still be some things going on. Right, behind the right. Or behind the, and you and you learn to listen. I think that's probably, you know, from uh, our clients, we are a very uh, relationship built company, and I would guess that a lot of integrators are, but for me, that means. I listen to what you're trying to solve. What problem are you trying to solve when you come to us to build a solution? And then we can, we're a design build company. We can build the solution that best meets your needs, not, you know, just exactly what your functional spec says. Because we find out through a lot of interviewing along the way that your functional spec missed some key things that you might need. And it doesn't even mean that we have to change the price because we're very used to building as a design build um, mentality, which means we know the design's not fully baked. We've got a lot of work to do to find out what you really need. Got it. Got it. So uh, tell me a little bit about what uh, Interstates uh, specializes in. Do you guys specialize in, in more manufacturing discrete or process or a little bit of both? A lot of, uh, very much process oriented. We do, we do a lot of discrete manufacturing too, but I would say uh, we cut our teeth in the process industries and we're, um, you know, our main focus is in uh, value added ag. Uh, we do a ton of work in converting ag products to a finished product. So any kind of a, you know, it really is classified as food and beverage, a lot of the work that we do, but it's very specialized in, you know, making soybean oil, making canola oil, making uh, ethanol, biodiesel, but chemical manufacturing, very similar. A lot of things are very similar there, but very heavy process industries. And then we work with, uh, you know, several manufacturing companies in their discrete manufacturing, in packaging equipment, um, you know, in building the widgets, uh, automating equipment that builds that, including, you know, food manufacturing where things like uh, you're building cinnamon rolls or you're building uh, butter braids or things like that. So a lot of, uh, again, food and beverage type things, but uh, very process industry. Uh, heavy. What are some of the biggest challenges that you're you're hearing uh, that you're tackling or maybe hearing from your clients right now? Yeah, that's a great question. It's it's changed a lot in the in I would say in the last three years we're hearing, you know, everybody's hearing about industrial Internet of Things, and uh, you know we've been doing research on that for probably five years or better, uh, trying to be ahead of the market and make sure that we know what's real and what isn't, what's hype and what can really be done. And so we've, you know, we've been able to coach a lot of clients into what's, what's the best things to do right now versus try everything. Um, so I'm, I'm sensing that, you know, that market has really changed how much information our customers need to collect as well as analyze in some fashion. So we're seeing a lot more just data analytics work. You know, we're hiring people that are more data scientists. You know, they, we've got a lot of computer science and electrical engineers, but now you're seeing a lot more mathematicians, you know, guys that are 
just very good at analyzing data and helping customers figure out what makes sense. So a big challenge for the industry is how do you hire differently? We got, we got a whole new industry we need to hire for here. So, uh, but still doing a tremendous amount of just standard automation work, but at a, you know, we're seeing a lot more ethernet networking type equipment. Uh, so your networks now are much more complicated than they've ever been. Um, you know, motor control centers are ethernet based now. So, you know, how do you build your switch system and, and your network to be able to handle all that traffic that's going to be there? So we have a, you know, one of our departments is strictly focused on just uh, manufacturing IT and how we can service that market, build the secure networks of the future, not just the what we need today, but how do we build a secure control system that you don't have to worry about the wanna cries or the uh, the other big, uh, huge viruses that are, you know, really attacking the industry out there today. Right, right. Are are there are there security issues that are? Um, well, let me ask you this: Why? Are, what do you think uh, security is such an issue in industrial systems? Why? Why is that? What are some of the? Are, is there are there things that they're that clients are doing or not doing, or why has this such become such an issue? Well, so probably one of the biggest. Uh, challenges to the industrial control systems today when you know if you went back 10 years ago most of your control system networks were fully disconnected from the business network so you had a instead of needing a firewall to protect uh, traffic coming through to your control system network you really had a physical disconnect there there was no you know unless somebody brought a thumb drive in and plugged it into a computer and even when they did, you didn't have internet connected to your uh, controls network. That's totally changed today. Um, and almost every control system today is connected through the business network to the outside world. Uh, we do remote support with those customers. You know, so we've got VPN connections. You've got a tremendous amount of potential uh, for being hacked that you didn't have before. So you need to build more security into your system. Give it the, you know, you know, we just have hackers that are, they're just out to cause havoc. You know, they don't care where it happens, but industrial networks, uh, controls networks are being hacked all the time today. It's something that they're, you know, they're looking for the, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard of the Stuxnet virus and, you know, we do a tremendous amount of research on all these types of viruses and how are they exploiting industrial control systems. Uh, you just have to be more concerned with that today than you used to because hackers know if they can get into an industrial con control system and just tweak the formulas a little bit even, you know, they can, they can cause somebody to get hurt through, you know, a shampoo that got developed or whatever that they add you know, a little less of this, a little more of that. And, you know, all of a sudden you've got a, you know, you've got a uh, really bad product out on the market. So you know, lots of different things that can happen there. So do you think that our, our hackers, are they seeking out industrial systems and utilities uh, or are they just kind of putting brute force hacks or, and, and attacks out there? Is it, I, I guess, are they looking for the, like, they're like, Hey, I know this is a water utility and I'm going to try to. Right. Right. Or, I know this is a motor and I'm going to try to make it go to a billion RPM, which. It, no, right. No, right. No. Yeah. So I'd say there's, it's twofold. Um, some of the industries, you know, like power for instance, and water, wastewater, those are things that, um, you know, are being hacked or trying to be hacked more frequently. They can disrupt, you know, they can really disrupt us a lot better by doing something like that. Industrial control systems, a lot of those are being hacked or, or getting viruses through the same thing that you might get at home, like the WannaCry virus. That was intended for, you know, businesses. It was really a virus that was out to try to, you know, ransom a bunch of computers that would now, they get money to unencrypt your hard drives. You know, so it was meant to disrupt. It's meant to, they get money through that. Most of your hackers out there today are just 
trying to cause, cause havoc. They're not after money. They just do it because they enjoy causing havoc. And, you know, this has been my assumption is I, I really feel like, you know, probably the cyber attacks of the future will be our, they're going to be the types of things that will, they're really there to be a terrorist attack. You know, they're going to shut down water, wastewater in a big area or shut the power grid down. That's what they're after. They want to, they're just looking for ways to really cause pain for us. So whether it's a business or the U.S. in general. So yeah, we're looking for rewards in the headlines, I suspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they don't even care if they got any money out of it. They just enjoy getting the headlines. Right. Uh, what are some of the skills that um, you find most useful in your in your day to day work? Well, so my day to day and what the group that I manage the the biggest, um, you know, we are I'm I'm the director of our project management team for uh, for interstates and communication skills huge. You know, if we one of the things that I, um, you know, if I had to pick the top three things that a PM needs to be the best at, communication and proactive communication, how do you help your client know what they need to know before they ask for it? Um, that's, I mean, that's how we win job after job with our clients because we're very proactive communicators. But in, but in addition to that, being very good risk managers, and just overall troubleshooters of the system. You know, what's going on with my project management processes that are causing my client issues that maybe every other customer has been just fine with, but looking for ways to improve just a, a, an entire um, continuous improvement process is what we're all about. So, you know, I think um, those, you know, those skills are very evident in, everybody we look to hire. We're, you know, we're after those that are the top performers in that, in those areas. Sure. Sure. Well, the, great. That leads great per, perfectly into my next question is, is, you know, it's, it's no skill or it's no secret that finding good skilled engineers is a challenge for an engineer, maybe in school, fresh out of school, maybe in high school, who is thinking about, you know, I've, I'd like, I like how electrons flow or I like right. to do, <laughs> You know, <laughs> I like to, I like working my hands uh, uh, or, or things like that. Um, why, why would they, why should they look at maybe industrial automation or control systems as, as a career opportunity and what kind of experience should they have? So, you know, that's an interesting uh, question in, in particular, we've really changed our um, methodology around hiring. Uh, we used to always look for very experienced people. And what we found was their experience doesn't collate to uh, the controls industry. You know, if they're electrical engineer or a power engineer, we still have a lot of training to do and sometimes untraining to do. So we've, we've really uh, pushed very hard. We do a lot of recruiting at the colleges and not only that, but teach in their classrooms and, uh, you know, get involved in their activities. Uh, so they get to know us. We, uh, you know, before we ever look at hiring them, we, we hire a tremendous amount of interns today and co-ops with the intention of trying out a lot of potential employees, getting them into real work right away and letting them see if that's the kind of work that they really want to do. That has been tremendously successful for us. Um, I would say we still hire Probably 20% of our people are more experienced, but 80% of them today would be more fresh college grads um, or one year of experience, you know, been out of college and maybe haven't even had their first real job yet. Uh, but we're, you know, it used to be the total opposite of that. Maybe 80% we wanted were experienced and 20% out of the schools. It's just uh, really flipped upside down from that perspective. And, and honest, honestly, very successful. The, um, you know, the new engineers coming out of, out of college, it's not that they have a different experience. They are very used to trying new things and troubleshooting. They've been programming or on electronics since they were three years old, you know, so they've, they've learned 
the trades uh, at a different level. You know, they understand how to do things that, you know, me, I didn't learn till I was in my 40s. Uh, you know, I didn't even have an email account till I moved to interstates. Never had had email. So <laughs> been here for almost 20 years now. And that just goes to show what's changed over time. Not even a prodigy or a comp you saw for company. Oh, I think at home, email. I definitely had a dial up <laughs> internet connection, but, but I, uh, I, I was probably AOL, but at work, I really didn't have an email account. You know, I never had had one. So we did everything by phone, you know, and you know, to be honest, that's one of the things that we have to teach the uh, younger generation as they come in. You do need to pick up the phone. Instant message and text doesn't always work. Uh, customers still like to be talked to in person and by phone. So uh, I've done a lot of coaching in that area to help help them understand the, the benefits of both. You know, you do have some benefits. It's more instant with instant messaging and texting and, and email, but it's also less personal and we're in a relationship company. We really want you to build a relationship. Yeah. Well, so, so it's interesting that you mentioned that because you said something earlier about, and you know, I asked you about some of the skills that you have and you mentioned, you know, communications, right? And so these aren't necessarily things that are uh, thought about um, in engineering school, right? And so who'd have thought that, you know, maybe an engineer is or, or should also study some of these soft, soft business skills as well. Right, right. right. And that's one of the things that's key with interstates. Um, we do a tremendous amount of training with our employees related to, um, you know, our goal is to give them a very well-rounded career. So you're going to get soft skills training. You're going to get leadership training, uh, obviously technical training, but it is a very well-rounded uh, employee when they come through our training program. And, and we focus really heavily on building that next level of the leadership skills. So we have a pipeline of leaders uh, that, you know, we feel very comfortable if I got hit by the bus tomorrow on the way to work, I have someone already identified that could fill my role. And we do that for all of our key roles. So from a client's perspective, the huge benefit you get there is I don't have to worry about if Joe leaves the company. There's three other people that have learned under Joe and can really come in and keep my business as you know, as a client, they can keep their business running as well. So uh, we do a tremendous about a 24 hour support for our clients where we have, a, we have uh, probably 20 full-time employees that do nothing but 24 hour support. And so a process company is down, you know, they've, their line's down, they can't produce product. They're losing money every minute they're down and they know how much it costs. And so we have people on call 24 hours a day that, that get them back up and running. And they're not project team members. They're 100% dedicated to support. And uh, they're kind of the jack of all trades. They know all the different technologies that we work in. So been a huge benefit to our clients as well as, you know, even our team members. We pull people out of support, move them into project teams because they're such good uh, project team members after learning, you know, through uh, putting fires out, how you really need to design and implement a control solution. Right. So let's, let's, I guess, lead that into uh, the best practices. You talked a little bit about, you know, uh, you know, the next man up, next person up, uh, right. you know, maybe even leading into a, a succession a little bit. So uh, maybe tell, tell our listeners, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's a, uh, a system integrator owner listening right now, mm -hmm. or maybe there's an integrator uh, or integrator owner listening right now, or perhaps there's a client uh, listening right now who's been using an integrator for a, a long time, has a great relationship, right. but maybe they're not a CSIA member. Maybe this, uh, it seems like a lot of system integrator owners are, you know, 58 years old, been right. running for 30 years um, and maybe haven't discovered CSIA yet. So why, why would a, why would a system integrator, you know, with 30 years in very successful business. Yeah. Want to implement the best practice. Well, let's, I guess, you know, why would they want to join the best practices uh, uh, or implement the best practices? Yeah. And what are the best practices? Maybe I asked that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. We, uh, 
So I joined Interstates uh, back in uh, 1999, and in 2002, uh, we had actually went to a few annual conferences before that, and and that's where we started getting engaged in um, in what CSI is all about. And uh, then in 2003, I pushed us to we're going to get certified. Um, I I grabbed the best practices and I said, why would you not do this? This is, it covers every aspect of a system integrator's business from, you know, ultimately from the, how do I build business, you know, business development, what are my HR practices? Uh, it, it covers, um, you know, succession planning, you know, how do you make sure that you're going to be here in the next 50 years, you know, that the company will still be able to survive you, uh, but also in just project management practice, system development life cycle, supporting areas like how do I make sure my client has everything they need to be able to continue to operate their, their systems after I leave. So uh, it's been a, it was a great process. Um, it took us about a year to get through um, preparing all the standard operating procedures we needed. We were a, um, uh, I, we did it for the very uh, intention of becoming a better business, though it had nothing to do with, we had no clients asking for it, but I looked at it and I said, I know we will be a much better business when we finish this. And we've now been, that we just were certified for our seventh time. Um, it's every three years. And uh, in December, we went through our, seventh audit and uh and you know the reason we continue to become certified is because every time we audit we find something different that we need to improve on it's a continuous improvement process for us and i um i'm a strong believer in if you're not continuously improving you're going backwards and um as a systems integrator technology changes so fast you have got to be constantly thinking about how you're going to reinvent yourself every three years. In, uh, and a good example of that is in project management methodologies. Um, in the controls industry, you know, we've been using waterfall uh, type uh, methodology for delivering projects forever. Uh, but we now have implemented a lot of agile practices in there. Our clients love it because they get to see their system at lots of places during the delivery, and they don't, they don't, they no longer think of us as we're delivering black magic to them, and they only see it during, you know, checkout commissioning and startup, and man, I sure hope that it does what I'm supposed, what it's supposed to do, or the first time I see is a user acceptance test, and I'm just hoping it's going to do what it says it's going to do. They see it a lot of times between day one of design through the last time we you're at their plant site for the final startup uh, things. So it's been a huge benefit for, for us and it's a huge benefit for our clients as well. Excellent. So and maybe just to tie a, a bow on the best practices. And I think we've mentioned this previously in other episodes, but uh, in case uh, you're not familiar with the best practices, they are, a, a series, basically it's the best practices manual is a, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, or a fill in any holes, but the best practices manual covers all the dimensions of a system integrator business from correct uh, uh, right human resources and sales and general management and project management and finance and all Absolutely. the different areas, right, that, that an integrator would have. And a lot of businesses actually, frankly, would have. Right. And uh, these are going to get into really the minutia of do you have this process or this thing in place in your business? And it asks, absolutely, are you doing this? Yes or no. If you're not doing that, well, there's a business process that, right. should, that will improve. So one thing would be, I think, you know, again, t hearkening back to what you said about uh, something happens to you, you know, hit by the bus theory. Um, you know, if the business owner is uh, the most important part of the business, it has, his or her hands in everyday operations. What happens if that person gets sick or worse? Right. Uh, 
or retires, right? Wants to retire. Right. What happens to the business? What happens to the customers? And so the best practices are, are things that are going to make sure that the, the, uh, there is some sort of uh, redundancies in, in that business so that things will continue to happen. In Correct. Case. And it is a, it's a growth process too. You know, we've, we've changed uh, tremendously um, as we've grown. Uh, When I started with Interstates um, in 1999, I think we were 32 or 33 employees, uh, mostly engineering, you know, with a, you know, a few admin staff to today we're 180 employees, uh, you know, and, you know, just uh, the whole how do you run your business when you're that, when you got that much bigger and best practices has been able to sustain us through all those big changes. So what we realized was every time you hit a potential milestone, like I I know 50 was one of the first milestones for us that, you know, we need to adjust how we're, how we manage our staff because you know we were I was the only HR person I was hiring I was firing I was teaching I was doing everything you couldn't do that any longer once you got to that 50 range then when we hit 100 we had another big uh, milestone that we just said you know we just can't manage the way we used to manage we need to add some other layers in here things that can help us make sure that our employees are being taken care of that our clients are being taken care of and that we continue to continuously improve. So it was, um, you know, that's just things that we learned through talking with other systems integrators at the annual conference uh, for CSIA. Uh, We learned through implementing best practices, but also just in sharing best practices with other integrators. We're involved in a peer group for systems integrators uh, I think there's eight or nine other companies in our peer group, and that has been huge for us. We've shared best practices. We've learned from them. They've learned from us. We've partnered with some of them on projects. You know, you always are looking to, you know, man, I got a huge valley coming or I've got a huge peak coming. How can one of my system integrator partners help me with that? So it's huge for our clients because we don't have to say no. We can still deliver. We still do the design get them exactly what they need. We just get help from other people on occasion. So, and we met all those people, built those relationships through uh, CSIA and, uh, and in particular the annual conferences. I think the coolest thing about this, the system integrator community, especially with CSIA is occasionally I'll get a call from an integrator and they'll say, Hey, I've, uh, I'm in Ohio or wherever, and we've got a customer out in, Washington state. I can't get there. They've got a control panel that's broken or some right. sort of process that's is down and they will trust a fellow member to go in there and fix it uh, and handle their client because they can't get there in time. And so I think it's a great kind of collaboration as though, you know, even though you might be at a conference or in a, maybe even a peer group with someone who is maybe a pseudo competitor of your I think under this CSIA umbrella is a, it's a great community where you're all here kind of really for the same reason. Right. And ultimately the whole, you know, the whole goal of CSIA was always to improve the systems integrator market space. We wanted businesses to, to improve so that end user clients would get a better end product. And uh, all of these business practices that you put together are helping you deliver better to your client. You know, you, and, and ultimately for interstates, um, you know, we make, we lose less money on what we would call killer jobs where, you know, we bid it and didn't know enough about, you know, how we were bidding it. We just don't, that doesn't happen like that near as much anymore. And we've, we've always been the, the type of integrator that our clients never have to be concerned that we're going to leave them hang. You know, we're going to stick with it no matter what it costs us to get it done. But we don't have to worry about that near as much anymore because we're not, you know, we know much more about what the client needs and we're asking a lot better questions today because of the continuous improvement that we did through CSIA's best practices. So I'm a strong believer in it. And like I said, I've been on best practices committee 
for more years than I can even uh, imagine to say I've actually helped develop version three, four, four and five. Um, and so I'm very bought into it, but for the reason that I, I really think um, that the more integrators that use it, the better we're going to be at providing a great end product to our clients. Yeah, and that's ultimately the the uh, the crux of the issue is is uh, when all integrators are more are implementing the best practices, they're all more professional, which is ultimately better for the client. It's better for the industry. And and, yep. and and I'd say better for the systems integrator industry in particular, because we have less, you know, some clients, if they've had a bad experience, it takes a long time to build trust with them. Um, if they've had good experiences, you know, they're willing, they partner very easily with people. Now they typically stick with, you know, whoever is delivering for them today you know, so you build that long-term partnership. Uh, but if they've had a bad experience, I, our experience with them has been, it takes some time. It takes maybe two or three projects to really prove to them that we're different, you know, that we're out to, to solve your issue and we're here to serve you. We're not here to make interstates great. It's about serving you. So, and, and I love that about interstates because we've, you know, it's, it truly is a servant leadership uh, leadership model. And uh, I've noticed that when the first day that I came to work for them, I knew something was different. I didn't know what to call it, but now I know what to call it. Right. So let's, I guess we, we, we've, we've touched on it a little bit, but let's dig in a little bit of a really kind of from the client's perspective, you know, why, why should a client hire a CSIA certified integrator? What, what do they get? You know, it's the old uh, radio station, WIIF. Yeah, yeah. What's in it for me? Yep, yep. So for, uh, and this would be from, you know, from the clients that, we've, that we um, uh, do, service, do service work or integration work or whatever with, they, uh, uh, they know that you at least follow a set set of standards. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, I can be 100% honest, every integrator, no matter if they're CSIA certified or not, will have a bad project. There's sometimes it's, uh, you know, it happened to be, you know, we thought we had a good understanding of scope, but for some reason we didn't get it all. Um, or, you know, the, uh, the, we've had several situations where a, a general contractor that we worked for would not let us talk to the end client. You know, they, they protected that um, and we didn't get the real scope from the end client. But you know, the, the, the cool thing with it is, it is it's certified by a third party um, auditor. It's kind of like, you know, I know some uh, large customers of ours have, have uh, auditors that come in and just certify that you're doing things that feel like they would be the best way to do them. So you're following best practices. Best practices doesn't give you any, uh, none of the standard operating procedures that I have today came from best practices. The, the theory behind them came from best practices. So, so that's where I think the, uh, the, the benefits really come from for an end client. It's, it's certified by a third party every three years that this person continues to follow and continuously improves through the use of best practices. Let's shift gears here a little bit. Um, what are some of the, uh, the cool things? Uh, what gets you out of bed as far as what kind of uh, innovations are happening right now in industrial automation and control systems with your clients? Or what do you want to tell your clients about? Like, you should be doing this. this is right, cool. right. Yeah. So, you know, the, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, the industrial internet of things is really changing. Um, you know, it's still, there's still a lot of things that are very um, early in the game. You know, there's so many vendors that are trying to produce products for the industrial internet of things, but the cool thing is it is going to happen and it is happening right under our noses today. Uh, and we love to do, the R and D side of that. Try to figure out how can we best serve our client market with tools and techniques or new 
pieces of hardware that really can add value to our clients. Um, so, you know, we're, we have a lab that we're, we're actually bringing a lot of those things in. We spend time trying it um, in a lab environment. We get a couple of clients that will, you know, take it on. Let us try this in your facility and then we'll, you know, we'll see if it's gonna work in an industrial environment. And then, you know, give them the benefit of trying some of that new and innovative stuff. Um, but really where we're seeing the, where our clients are gaining the most from that is in how well they can collect data and then the tools that are available today to analyze that data and put it into more of a dashboard view or something that really shows, hey, I got a problem happening and it looks like it's on line one but you know there's a bottleneck somewhere let's go figure out what it is well the data is helping them figure out what their bottlenecks are uh, we go in and we you know ask for what are their what are your problems you're trying to solve and then we look to see can we collect more data and help you find the real solution there and uh had some tremendous successes with it you know just literally you know taking huge bottlenecks out of their systems to just you know, their, their production's up, their quality's up, um, you know, and their people are much more happy with working for them because they realize, hey, my plant's not going down as often as it used to. So I think that's really some of the stuff that we just get very excited about is how we can add more value to the client when most of it not even that expensive. You know, it's, it's really reapplying some of the technologies they already have but just in better ways. So um, I think we're gonna see a continued um, push for that though in the industrial space, um, and in particular in the industrial space. What do you, uh, what do you tell lay people you, what you do? How do you explain this? <laughs> My wife still tells me, I still don't know what you do. <laughs> But you know, it is, uh, you really do need kind of an elevator speech for, for that so you can kind of show them. But if you think about um, when, when you look at something that you have in your house, shampoo, um, you know, the fuel that you burn in your car, all of that uh, requires a certain amount of automation to be able to do it well and make it in a quality fashion and protect the employees that are working around it. A lot of the control systems, they, the, the big thing that it's doing for them, it's, it uh, makes decisions in microseconds that a human wouldn't even notice that were happening until we're already in a big problem, you know? So it's, it's about building a solution that, that saves lives, uh, produces better, quality product and, you know, really um, more production capacity uh, for them. So it's not about replacing, you know, for the most part, the, the people are still there, but it really is helping them do things that are more valuable uh, that a human can do better. Let the computers do the things that they're the best at. Let the humans do the things that, that they're best at. Absolutely. So, uh, at the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that you, you moved to Arkansas. When, when was that? Was that as a teenager or where were you, where were you born and how did you? Yeah. So when was that? Did you move it's interesting because I actually was born in Arkansas. Okay. Um, my parents moved to uh, the North uh, for, to a company that does transformer rebuilding. Uh, my dad was the engineer. He'd been in a transformer company his whole career up until that point. But in 1975, we moved from Arkansas, I was in eighth grade at the time. Um, spent, you know, I grew up in a, I was in a town, but much bigger town. The town we moved to was a town of 500 people. So, uh, you know, it was much different. I could be in all the sports. In fact, you pretty much had to be because we didn't have enough to, to have a sports team if not all the guys in the class went out. So we, you know, we got to do pretty much everything we wanted. And I then went to engineering school um, in a small college, a state college, just north of the town we lived in, uh, South Dakota State University. Got my power engineering degree, and then that's when I moved back to Arkansas. I thought, 
you know, it's pretty cold up in the north. I think I can, I want to go south for a while. And my wife actually is from the north. And she's the one that pushed me pretty hard to take a job in the south. We lived there for four more years and realized, you know, you can always put more clothes on to stay warm, but you can't take enough off to get cold. So uh, we moved back to the north because it was too hot in the south. So, uh, and we had two kids at that point. You know, we had our first two children, and it's kind of nice to be a ground grandparents again. So uh, we moved back to the same town and spent another 10 years working for a uh, kind of a sister company to the company my dad worked for. And uh, then I decided uh, it was time to uh, spread my wings and do something a little different. And I wound up at Interstates. It was actually, I wandered into the town looking for a job. Didn't even know there was a company by the name of Interstates. And um, just walked in, I was interviewing in a different company. And I had an interview, I had a phone call uh, before I even got home that day, they would already left me a message at home. There weren't a lot of cell phones in those days. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I came back the next day and uh, within a week I was working for them and uh, loving, I just absolutely uh, fell in love with Interstates and, and what they stand for. And so that's been my uh, story and I'm sticking to it. It's been, yeah. I can, I, uh, I tell every employee, that I interview and I interview a lot of employees to come to work for interstates. And if, you know, we do not micromanage, I love it. Uh, but we are very leader oriented. We want people to all become leaders. And so we do a tremendous amount of leadership training. And I think that's why people stick around. They, they love the fact that we invest a tremendous amount of money in our employees. That's excellent. That's excellent. So how many years has it been now? That you've Almost been? 20. Um, I'll be uh, celebrating a new anniversary. So, um, but yeah, I've loved, I, I just can't imagine uh, going back to working for a company like the, all the other companies I had worked for before Interstates. So. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate the time that you spent with us uh, today and uh, hopefully uh, people some, learned some things. I definitely learned some things about you today. Um, anything else you want to close with or make sure somebody knows about interstates? Well, I just would encourage, you know, all of the, um, whether you're an integrator, you know, look at the Control System Integrators Association. Uh, you will be very surprised at how much benefit you can get from joining an organization like that. From an in-client's perspective, look for integrators that, uh, that do things well, that are poised well for the future so you know they will be around for the long term. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've put a tremendous amount of focus into making sure that we've got new people always moving up into the the new spots to take over for those of us that are trying to become better leaders and move into new spots as well. So we, we do a lot of work in, uh, in transition planning, uh, just being really uh, purposeful about uh, making sure we have the next generation ready to go before they're needed. So yeah, and I really appreciate you taking the time, Tony, today to, to interview me. I've enjoyed doing it and uh, look forward to uh, seeing many of you. If you come to our annual conference, I'd love to see you there. I'll be there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. We have an annual conference, uh, usually in April uh, or early May. Check out csiaexecutiveconference.org. And Jeff, go ahead and give your domain and your website real quick. Yes, uh, our domain is uh, uh, www.interstates.com. And uh, you'll find plenty of good information out there. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff Miller, Interstates. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also appreciate a like, share, and comments about what you hear. Visit csiaexchange.com forward slash podcast for a full list of episodes to subscribe or to contact us. We'd like to hear what topics you want to learn about and who you'd like to hear from.
Music provided by bensound.com under a Creative Commons license. This is a production of the Control System Integrators Association, CSIA. Thanks for listening to the Talking Industrial Automation Podcast. Read the Industrial Automation blog and find and research qualified system integrators at csiaexchange.com. For more information on why your system integrator should be CSIA certified, visit controlsys.org, controlsys.org.